Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to our webinar today. This is uh, a webinar on the 2021 ARMA Student Design Competition Slack Slope webinar. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, if you have any questions, uh, please type them into the uh, question pane that you can see uh, indicated here in the slide. Um, and then uh, we will uh, answer all the questions that you might have at the end of the webinar. Thank you. So, um, hello everybody, I'm Lauren Lorig, uh, and I'll be the main uh, speaker at this, um, this webinar. Just a little bit about me, I wish we could all be together in a, in a room, but um, we're still not uh, there yet. Um, but I joined ITASCA in uh, 1985 after I did my uh, PhD studies at the University of Minnesota. Uh, for about 15 years, I was general manager of ITASCA's uh, Chile office. So if you don't feel comfortable writing your <laughs> questions in English and you'd rather write them in, in Spanish, I can take a crack at, at those uh, as well at the end. Um, I was uh, CEO of, uh, of ITASCA International for, uh, for eight years. Um, and currently, I'm just a principal geotechnical consultant at, uh, at Itasca, um, doing things that I really enjoy doing, and this being one of them. Um, I've been an ARMA board member for uh, about the last six years, and I've been helping for the last month or so develop this ARMA student design uh, competition. So to tell you a little bit more about that, I want to introduce Juan Monsalve. Um, he's a, a PhD candidate at Virginia Tech and one of two uh, students who have been uh, instrumental in, in pulling this competition um, together. Juan is vice president of the ARMA student chapter at Virginia Tech, and he's also part of the ITASC Education Partnership Program. So Juan? So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lorik. Uh, welcome, everyone. It is a pleasure to have you here. Uh, so today I'm going to just give you some uh, details, which I think if you have gone to our webpage, you already are familiar with some of them about this ARMA student design competition. So first of all, I would like to acknowledge uh, Dr. Lorik for all his help and support he has given uh, Christian and, and I like uh, while proposing this and working uh, this to make it real. Uh, and Itasca Consulting Group, uh, which is uh, one of our main sponsors, along with the American Rock Mechanics Association and the College of Engineering of the University of Kentucky. So uh, this idea was uh, initially proposed by the uh, uh, student chapter of the University of Kentucky and uh, along with our student chapter at Virginia Tech. So we hope uh, you guys take advantage of this opportunity and, and make the best of it. So you can go to the next slide, please. So as the, the initial objective for this student design competition was to involve students from uh, different universities that would offer rock engineering related pro, uh, programs uh, with a, an engineering, a real rock engineering problem. So we could test maybe their, their knowledge or also uh, get them excited about uh, rock engineering engineering which is a field uh, I think most of us uh, enjoy and, and, and like and that's probably why we are all here and the idea is that uh, all the teams are gonna provide the, the best solution that they that they come up with and, and then uh, try to solve this problem so with regards to the team's formation I have uh, been receiving uh, a few questions from all, uh, from uh, many people interested in the competition so as we stated in the web page or and in the initial initial guidelines, uh, the teams can, can be formed uh, from two to five uh, members. Uh, they could be both undergrad and or graduate students. Uh, but we really encourage that that uh, your teams are formed by a mix of undergraduate and graduate students, and also, if possible, that you integrate maybe uh, students from geology or geological engineering, civil engineering. Uh, mining, petroleum, or even environmental, uh, it would be great to see teams conformed by, by multidisciplinary uh, uh, groups. So uh, it is really encouraged from, from us. So each university uh, is allowed to have more than one team participating. 
So that, that's not a, a problem if there's a, two teams from the same university. And another important thing is that a, the teams should have an academic advisor. This is most, a, mostly like to make sure that the people that is participating, a, is, they, they are actually students. And a, two teams from the same university can have the same advisor. There's no problem with that. I just wanted to make that clear. Uh, and, I, and I think that that would be all. So if you guys have any additional questions, uh, just just uh, put those in the email. I'll be more than happy to, to answer those at, at, the, at the end. And this is just uh, some important deadlines for you to take into account. Uh, the team registration period goes through April 16th. So there's uh, one more week uh, for your teams to be registered. Uh, if you want to register, just go to the web page of the competition in the registration tab. Uh, you just fill in that form. And uh, I think by the end of Friday next week, when the registration period is over, we will be sending you all uh, 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 an email uh, making sure that you are uh, registered in the competition. Today is the, the webinar. Uh, and the competition will begin on uh, April 19th. So on April 19th, we will be posting in our web page uh, all the details uh, about the problem. We will also be giving you some guidelines on, on what you need to present in this initial document. So there will be two stages, an initial stage, in, uh, stage where you would submit a report. Uh, from that report, there will be like a, an initial selection where uh, the judges will select a, a few uh, finalist teams. Uh, so the the notification will be on June 4th, and the, the teams will have like one additional week uh, to prepare a presentation, uh, which will be uh, held online uh, on June 11th, where they will be uh, with the judges, and, and they will be presenting uh, their work for, for like a final selection. The results will be uh, notified by June 11th, and the competition uh, and the winners will be awarded uh, during the ARMA uh, annual meeting. So, so if you have any additional questions on this, you can go to the web page for for more details. And I just want to thank you all for for being here today, and and I hope you you make the best of it. And thank you, Dr. Larry, for for your time and and your interest in helping us with this. And and I hope uh, everybody enjoys this this webinar. Thank you very much. Thanks, Juan. Um, so just a few more uh, words on, on this. This is the first time that ARMA has uh, developed uh, a student design competition. Uh, so we're not uh, exactly sure how it's all going to go. Uh, we think we, we have a good plan in, in, in place. Um, but, um, you know, be patient uh, with, with everybody. I'm sure we'll uh, refine this and prove it as as the years uh, go on. But I know, as a member of the ARMA board, we're we're quite excited uh, to be involved in this. And we think, you know, there's there's good uh, value in in uh, these kinds of activities. Um, I should say that um, the problem that we're going to present for you to to solve um, is geared at. Uh, and it's a little bit hard to say because we we haven't uh, you know done this before, but we're hoping that it can be solved and and written up and presented in in uh, by working maybe you know a couple of weekends with your team or you know certainly less than a week. Uh, you all are involved in in your own studies and your own work, uh, and this is something extra that uh, that we we hope you'll you'll get involved in and hopefully learn something uh, from and so we've tried to, to tailor the problem so that you know it, it's a few days worth of of, of effort and uh, and maybe a little research and and writing it writing it all up um, so uh, the rest of the seminar i'm going to talk about uh flax slope uh, I should say that you do not have to use flax slope to solve this problem at all. Uh, there are plenty of other uh, tools available uh, to you uh, to, to use, um, and they are perfectly fine to be used in, in solving uh, this problem. 
But we thought for anybody who didn't have access to other tools, um, this is one that you uh, can use. It, it will allow you to, to solve the, the, the problem and work on it, um, and it, it's free. So um, that's why we thought we would at least go through this with you, and um, you can decide then uh, what, what kind of tool you want to use to work on this. The FLAC Slow program is a specialized version of, of FLAC for stability uh, analysis. Now, FLAC is a very, very widely used tool, and uh, it, it has lots of, of capabilities. Um, it, it, um, we won't be using all of those in this uh, presentation. You can see, um, you can see some of the capabilities on the on the left-hand side there. But at the end of the day, it's a tool for solving slope stability problems in a, in a very uh, simple and straightforward manner. And hopefully you'll, uh, you'll, you'll find that to be the case. And I'm hoping I can demonstrate that uh, to you. It is, as I said, uh, uh, freeware downloadable from the Itasca website. The, the, the primary engine for, for this is uh, a tool to calculate the factor of safety and slope stability. That's often the, in, the primary goal is to find out how close to failure uh, we are. And there are all sorts of acceptance criteria that um, are, are based on the factor of safety typically on the order of 1 1.2, 1 1.3, 1 1.4, uh, depending on, on consequences and risks and so on. But how does uh, FLAC slope get to a factor of, of safety? Well, it performs a number of simulations with different trial properties to find the stability limit. That is the point where if we were to reduce or dial down the strengths any further, we would get slope failure. Um, and so you can see the equations are quite simple down at, at the bottom, but the cohesion and friction uh, or tangent of the friction are reduced by trial values to determine a, uh, a safety factor. And this is often called in the literature a strength reduction factor. It's the factor that we have to reduce the initial properties by to, uh, to see failure. So the question is, well, how, how good is this, um, this particular trial and error scheme, if you like, um, in a numerical model? Well, we can compare it to some exact solutions that have been developed, and, and I'm showing you one here. We'll actually go through this, and hopefully we get a similar answer. Uh, we'll see. Uh, but this is a slope with a 45-degree uh, angle. It's 10 meters high. Uh, and you can see the properties there in, in the in the lower uh, right, 20 degrees friction and 12.38 kilopascals, uh, a density of 2,000 kilograms per, per cubic meter. And so um, when we run that uh, problem uh, with uh, flax slope, we get answers very close to, to one. So the analytic solution that it's compared to is based on what's called an associated flow rule. Uh, an associated flow rule is where the dilation is equal to the friction angle. And it's a special thing that allows uh, analytic solutions to be, to be found, not that it's necessarily realistic. Most real geomaterial soils and rocks have dilations that are uh, smaller than the, than the friction angle. Um, and the answers, and those are called non-associated uh, results. So the, the dilation and the friction angle of the material are not associated with each other. Uh, but when we run this in flax slope, we get answers that are very close to one. And you'll, you'll see that the, the answer differs slightly depending on the size of the grid that we use. And we'll talk about that as we go through here. You have the option in flax slope to, to select 
uh, the, the sort of grid or the discretization that you want to use. And the answers will differ slightly based on that. As you get finer and finer grids, you get more and more accurate uh, answers. Um, but you know, there's a point of diminishing returns. You don't need to make it so so fine that uh, you know it takes a long time to to run. So what are the advantages of using a numerical model like flax slope to find the uh, safety factor? Well, the first and primary one is that the failure mode develops naturally. It doesn't need to look for a trial surface in advance as limit equilibrium models do. But for simple problems, um, limit equilibrium and uh, numerical models produce very uh, similar answers. The, the, the difference starts to appear when we have more complex failure modes that limit equilibrium models are uh, not able to uh, resolve so well. And so that's where numerical models often have a, a particular advantage. Um, but numerical models are not restricted in terms of, of their geometry. And this particular methodology of reducing the shear strength to find stability can be used in slopes, as we'll be looking at, also footings, tunnels, pillars, what, whatever uh, you have. It's, it's, a, it's a very flexible methodology for determining safety factors. Uh, it doesn't involve any artificial parameters um, like inner slice force angles or, or so on. Everything in the, the modeling is, is very physical and you can even stop things um, in, in, at intermediate stages and they will look like uh, physical, uh, meaningful answers. Um, it, we can develop multiple failure surfaces that have complex internal yielding and very often this can happen in, in slopes where we have uh, maybe um, a, a, a active passive mechanism forming. Uh, and we can also um, use uh, structures um, in, in the models that represent rock bolts or geogrids or things like that. The uh, example problem and the student problem that we're gonna present does not require any of, any of the structural elements to be to be used. Okay, well, so those that all sounds good. What are the disadvantages? Well, really, there's a, there's only really one, and that's speed. Um, limit equilibrium programs typically run uh, faster than numerical models. Uh, they usually solve in in a number of seconds. Um, running uh, numerical solutions with flax slope usually take, depending on the grid size, less than a minute up to up to several uh, minutes. Um, but there's, so there's no real drawback in using numerical models to solve these kinds of problems, given that we'll be able to solve these, these problems in, in a number of, of minutes, about the time it takes you to run and get a cup of coffee and come back. Uh, but there is one other perceived problem with numerical models, and that is, um, that um, they are difficult to, to use. And FLAC itself is really no exception. It's a general purpose tool um, that solves all kinds of, uh, of problems in underground excavations, slope stability, um, you, you, you name it, anything that is a geotype structure, dams, tailings, dams. Um, can be solved with, with FLAC. But in order to make uh, a particular class of problems easier to solve, that is slope problems, we developed FLAC slope and it has um, you know, a graphical interface that allows these models to be set up and run uh, very, very quickly. So it should be, I hope you'll find it's just as easy to use as a limit equilibrium program and maybe in some sense a little bit more uh, flexible. As I said, it does use the computational engine that is in, in FLAC, but everything else is kind of hidden from, from the user and point and click operations are really all that are, are needed. 
So uh, getting into a little bit more about Flax Slope, it, it, it analysis project with Flax Slope is divided into four stages, and we'll see how this works. Uh, the first stage is uh, the construction of the uh, of the model itself, um, and then the next stage is the building of the model, uh, the boundary, the internal properties, the material assignments. Um, and in our case, we'll be considering the addition of, of water, um, but you can have all kinds of other things. You can have non-standard gravity to look at um, pseudostatic dynamic analysis for, for earthquakes where you might wanna have a, some sort of horizontal gravity component. You might wanna have an interface to represent a, a, a specific fault or weakness in the, in the um, geology. Uh, you might want to apply some loads that represent a surcharge. So all those things are taken care of in the build stage of the, of the model. Um, and then the final or next to the last stage is, is the solve. Um, and part of that then is the selection of the, the grid. And uh, then the calculation by the program of the factor of safety. And finally, plotting of the results to look at the failure mode and, and so on. So these are the four stages that are used in a flax slope analysis project. So the basic steps then with, within those stages, and we'll, we'll go through all of these, uh, but just thought I'd list them up here on, on the slide so you have it. Um, so the first thing is to develop the, the problem uh, geometry. And uh, th there is uh, a geometry which is called general, which uh, is just as it says, it's general. You can put any sort of uh, slope geometry you like together and it, it will uh, handle that. And then there is a, a build stage to define the geology, uh, assign the properties to that geology, maybe put in a water table, and then select a grid and solve. Now, once you have that, you may want to change some things and, and the design uh, problem that we'll present to you will best be solved by then adjusting um, the, the boundary because we're going to be looking to optimize the, the slope. Uh, and you may want to adjust the water to, uh, to get better uh, stability. And so uh, you have all those things uh, available to you, and I'll show you how that, that can be done. And you can keep on refining it um, as much as, as you like. So those are the, the basic steps that are, that are involved. Uh, just a couple of tips. Um, one of the places where you may run into a problem is if you try to match the geologic boundary with a slope geometry that involves uh, benches and you try to match those things exactly. Uh, it doesn't happen often, but if you try to match them exactly, it may, it may move the geology for you um, to a place you don't really want it to be. If that happens, just move those nodes uh, slightly and, uh, and, and you'll, be, you'll be just fine. Um, but it's always a good idea to uh, try different meshing options, and I'll show you how that can be done. Um, and start with a, a coarse mesh and, and then gradually uh, refine it. And so the mesh options are over there to, to the right. There's one that controls the, the density and then the scheme, and there's all kinds of schemes that uh, can be uh, can be. Uh, looked at, and it's just a matter of trying those and, and, and looking at how it <laughs> appears to you and selecting one to, to go ahead with. So there is some uh, help available. Uh, there's a, a help tab at, at the top, and this is what you'll see if you do that. Uh, if you click on PDF manuals, it says manuals. There's really only one manual. It's the FLAC slope manual. Uh, but it's very complete. It's over 100 pages. Um, you can download it, you can print it, or you can look at it online. Uh, but it's very helpful. And uh, 
So two of the problems I'm going to show you uh, are, or at least one of them is in the in that uh, manual with step-by-step -step instructions. So if you uh, don't catch everything I cover today, you can go to that manual and uh, and read more about it, and I'm sure you'll be uh, you'll you'll be just fine. So the two problems that we're going to uh, look at are, are are shown here, and uh, you don't need to write any of these things down. Uh, you, you'll get, you can get a copy of this presentation after we finish, and you can have this uh, if you want to try these on your own. Uh, but these are the two problems that we're going to start with, and then I'll do one more uh, at, after that. So right now, I'm going to finish the PowerPoint presentation, and I'm going to go to Black Slope. And this is, this is the start screen. Uh, up in the upper left, you will see the four stages that I talked about, models, build, solve, and plot. And as you go on to each of those, you'll see uh, what the, um, the various dialogues uh, look like. But the first thing you have to do is select the model options, which is in the middle of the screen here. Um, and it, it allows you to tell uh, Flax Slope the kinds of things you're going to be, be doing. Um, in this first problem, it, it's very simple. We're not going to be invo invoking any of these things. Um, we, you also have the choice on the system of, of units. I particularly like SI units uh, in terms of meters, kilograms, and second. That's pretty pretty standard, but understanding that in the United States and some other countries, uh, you might want to use English uh, units, and you can do that, uh, and all those units will come up for you in a consistent set of, of uh, values. So um, what we do need to do then um, is uh, uh, start our, uh, the, the model. We're not going to be using any of these uh, options. Um, and we could, if we had some previous projects, uh, pick one of, one of those. So you can go back to a previous project. Uh, but I, I'm just going to press OK. And it comes up with this uh, dialog box. You can give the the title up here, uh, and I'm just going to say Chen because that's the analytic or the author of that analytic solution. Uh, and I'm going to give a file name, uh, which can be the same or it can be different. I'm just going to call it Chen One, but it could be Fred or Bob or whatever. Uh, and it's going to go into this location uh, where I'm doing all my work uh, on, on this particular thing. And so it just says, OK. So that's where all the information is going to be stored. And now I can build my model. So I, I have a, a new model I'm going to construct. And here are the options, the dialog box for the new option. Uh, and the easiest one is this uh, simple model uh, with just one slope. So I'm going to press OK on, on that. And uh, so this box comes up. So this is this is the dialog box that construct the the uh, the slope, and um, so the the rise uh, for this particular uh, problem is is 10 meters. This is the one that we were looking at with the Chen solution, and you just fill in these uh, these parameters um, here. So a 10 meter high slope uh, with 45 degrees. Um, the depth out in, in front here, I'm just going to make it three meters, and the left-hand boundary I'll make three meters, and the right-hand boundary of 10 meters, and, and that's all. And, and so I can look at this now and see what that looks like, and that looks, that looks pretty good. Uh, so I can say OK, uh, and, and I like that. Now, these little handles up here the little red boxes on the boundary I could move if I wanted to uh, but I'm not going to do that right now I've got this e exactly where uh, where I want it uh, so I'm going to go okay and I'm going to go to uh, the, the build stage and um, there's only one material here so I don't have to worry about any layers I'm just going to go to the materials 
And um, then I'm going to create a new material. So if I look over here on the right, there's a, a button to create and that pulls up a dialog box for, uh, for the materials. Now the class allows us to, uh, if we wanted to, uh, to build up a database of, of materials and they would all be in there. So maybe you have something which is called uh, fill or dump and another one which is rock, uh, you know, what, whatever you, you might want to do. We don't have to deal with that now. Uh, and we don't even have to give it a, a special name. Uh, just new one is, is good enough, but we could give it a name if we wanted to. Now, there are three different constitutive models available to us, a more Coulomb uh, model, uh, a ubiquitous joint model, and a modified Hook-Brown uh, model. Um, and you're probably familiar with more Coulomb and hopefully with Hook Brown. A ubiquitous joint model is a, uh, a more Coulomb model that allows us, if we were to, to click on that, to define some joint properties in terms of their orientation and strength in a particular orientation. So it's very useful if we're solving problems uh, that have uh, very uh, closely bedded uh, geology, so schists or shales or things like that might be a ubiquitous joint uh, model. But for this example, we just have a, a more Coulomb model. Um, the, the density for this model is uh, 2,000 kilograms per cubic meter. Uh, the, the cohesion was this strange 12.38 um, uh, kilopascals. Notice that the, the units are pascals here. So, you know, I have to put some zeros there sometimes. It's not kilopascals or megapascals, but pascals. Uh, the tension in this example was zero. The friction was 20 degrees. And that's all fine. So i put that there. I get a list of materials in the upper left, and there's only one to assign that to this model. I just click on the... Um, the area and any place inside the slope, and that will assign that material to uh, to this particular problem. So, so that's okay. Uh, and now we're moving to the solve stage, and I have to um, uh, determine a, a grid. So I've clicked on solve. I have options for course, and that's what the course looks like. Uh, this is what the medium looks like, and here's the the fine, and I could also do uh, a special sorts of thing and, and look at different uh, options for for the mesh. For this example, it's 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 uh, it's fine just to use a coarse mesh. So there's the mesh, and all I have to do now to run this problem is solve for FOS. So I'm going to click on this icon for solve FOS. It comes up with some parameters uh, to be included in the factor safety calculation. In most cases, we're going to include all of those, but you don't have to. You could do what's called the partial safety factor for friction, one for cohesion. Uh, you, you, could, you could do all that. And then there's some tweaks to the bracketing algorithm, but you don't really have to worry about any of those things. Um, so we're just going to we're just going to uh, run this as is uh, using friction and cohesion. Uh, as the, the material that will be reduced. So here it's running up here and it's doing this back, bracketing and it's you can see the values over here on the on the right. It's it's running through here and uh, honing in by bracketing on a solution. And it comes up and says the best estimate for the safety factor is 0 0.975. So that's the safety factor for this example. And we'd like to see what the failure mode looks like. In order to do that, um, we go to plot and it shows um, the, the failure mode. And it's just exactly what we'd expect, um, almost a, a circular failure mode. Uh, it has these vectors that are showing the direction of movement. It has shear strain contours to show us where it's it's sort of localizing to form a, a failure. Um,
But up here uh, on the upper left, we can see the project name, we can see the title, uh, the model number, and uh, and then the contours over here. But most importantly, we can see the the factor safety is 0 0.97. So we might want to look at some other things. So we can do that if we go uh, to the items uh, under under plot and we can see what some of the items are. We might want to turn off, for example, the uh, the fill and of the of the uh, strain rate uh, contours, and we might want to look at plasticity indicators, for example. So I've just clicked that, and if I do that, then I can see. Um, see this a little bit better. Um, I can see, for example, the, where, where failure is occurring. I can see um, what the, the, the uh, failure indicators are for the material. So most of them are these uh, sort of reddish asterisk, which indicates it's at yield in shear. So it's a shear failure. But up at the top, uh, we've got these little magenta circles indicating tension failure at, at, at the top. So this is you know logical. We've got shear failure in most of the slope, but we have a tension failure. And if we did a, a little bit of a refinement on this, we would we could probably see a pretty nice tension crack forming at at, at the top. Um, so that's really all that I wanted to uh, to do with this example. Um, you can see it gives a, a factor of safety very close to the to the analytic um, solution. So now what I'd like to do is go to um, the, the second problem that I had outlined uh, for, as an example problem. So to do that, um, by the way, I, I could I could go up and uh, probably should go to file and save this project and now it's saved i think it does it automatically but just to be sure you can you can save it and let's go now to a, a new model so i go back to the first stage which is model i go to uh, new and um, so i have a new model this is going to be model uh, two um, or I, let's call it something else let's call it uh, let's call it tutorial that's the name of, of this particular model. It's also going to just have a simple geometry like, like that. And we, we, we bring this thing up. But if you remember uh, on the example I showed, the thing actually was facing the other way. So there's a simple way we can do that. We can make a mirror layout by checking this uh, box at, at the bottom and it'll flip it around uh, for us. But now I'll just put in the um, the values. The uh, the total height of that particular uh, model was was 14 meters. Uh, sorry, the rise. Uh, I take that back. The rise was uh, 10 meters. Um, the slope uh, was two to one, so it had a run of uh, 20 meters. So that's a two to two to one slope. Uh, the depth is this part in front of the toe, and we'll make that uh, four meters. And the same for the left-hand part, uh, the right, which is this part up here in the at the at the crest. We'll make that one um, 15 meters, and we can leave the bottom where where it is, uh, the origin. And we can uh, apply that, and now we have this kind of a slope, uh, and that's that's fine. We 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 like that, so we can press OK. And now this mature particular problem had two um, layers in it, so I'm going to go to uh, build, and I'm going to define those those layers. So this takes me to a different dialog box uh, over here. Um, and I'm going to add a, a layer to the model, uh, and it happens to be at about four and a half meters down from the top, or nine and a half meters uh, up from the, from the bottom. So if I just click anywhere inside of this model, it will put um, a, a layer there. You can see this red line then defines um, the division between these two materials. 
if I want to edit that uh, and get it exact, I can press on this edit button and I can um, I can edit this numerically down here at, at the bottom. And I can see, uh, well, it's not at 9.5, it's at 9.3563, but I can change that here and make it 9.5. Um, and I can make this 9.5 as well. And that'll move that just a little bit, but it's exactly on 9.5 right now. Um, so I'm going to press OK. And here's now my, my model with the two layers, but I have to assign some materials to this. So I'm going to go over to the material uh, button. And um, I'm going to now uh, assign uh, materials. I'm going to create the first one. And um, well, let's call this the upper the upper um, uh, just call it upper. That's good enough. Um, the uh, density for this is fifteen hundred, and uh, the cohesion is uh, five thousand kilopascals. So I put five. Uh, sorry, it's five kilopascal. Five kilopascals or five thousand pascals. Um, the um, the friction angle for this is twenty uh, degrees, and that's all that I have. So there's that uh, particular model is upper, and I can put that um, there. And I'm going to create an, another model, a a new model. Um, another one we'll call lower, new material, I should say. Uh, and it has a density of uh, 1800. And it has a, a cohesion of uh, 10,000 pascals or 10 kilopascals. Uh, and a friction of 25 degrees, and that's okay. Now I can click anywhere in this lower part, and I have now two uh, materials in here. All right, so I've got that, and this is okay, so I can do okay. Um, and I can solve this. Again, you can see the different uh, zoning options that are available to you. Um, again, we're just going to take the simplest one, the course model, and go to solve FOS. And we'll find out what the failure mode is for, for this. And we can plot this, uh, plot this uh, result. Uh, I'm going to go back and go back, change the items, look at the shear strain rate uh, for this. I'm going to take out the plasticity indicators, and you can see the um, the failure mode for this particular uh, uh, setup with the factor safety about 1.69. Now, if you'll recall in the in the example I showed, it actually had uh, water in it, um, and I can go ahead and add that in. Um, ideally, you do that at the uh, at at the beginning when you uh, when you set it up. You click on the uh, model option that includes water. Um, I forgot it. I believe I can go back and get that now. Um, so I'm going to go to File, and I'm going to look at Model Options up here. And I'm going to click on the one that says uh, water table. So there's the um, there's the water table now. And I'm going to go OK. Uh, I'm going to leave it as the same file name. Uh, and I'm going to overwrite uh, what, what I had there. Um, 
So now I've got this thing all set up. I can go back to build. And now I have water out here. I can add in. Um, I'm just going to move this uh, water table uh, to where I, I want it. Um, and now this is just like the layers. I can I can move this around by just uh, clicking on it, and you can see uh, how easy it is to to move this around and get whatever water table um, you, you like. So now we have um, water table in here. Uh, so I'm going to say OK. Now, one of the problems is that I forgot to um, talk about the, the wet density of the material. Uh, we only had a dry density. So I'm going to go back to the materials, and I'm going to edit those, the upper material. And I'm just going to edit that. Uh, here's the material, um, and I had a wet density for for that of 1800. I can either specify a porosity or a wet density. Um, in this case, I'm using a wet density for that. And the same for the lower one now. Um, I'm going to change its uh, density by just uh, assigning that uh, here uh, as 21. 100 kilograms per cubic meter. So now we have uh, a different density ab above and below the water table, which is as it as it should be normally. So here's my problem now: um, uh, materials above and below the, uh, the 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 layer, and a water table, a slope geometry, everything that I need. I'm going to go to um, the uh, ah, I don't need to go to that. So I cancel or say okay. I want to go to solve. Go back to my course mesh and solve this. Um, and here we go. It's doing the bracketing. Remember we had something. What was it? One point six seven or so before, and we're getting a lower safety factor now. That's what we would expect. Uh, One point four six. So we're going to look at the uh, the plot for for this, and you can see it's a much lower, uh, much larger uh, failure volume. It goes much deeper into the slope, and we can see our our uh, safety factor up up here. Um, now um, there 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 are two model tabs down here at the bottom. That uh, would allow me to to look at at the previous results. Model one is um, this other example. Uh, the tutorial is this particular example. Uh, what I can do if if I want to uh, print out some information, and I'm not going to go in how to get uh, hard copy plots of these uh, failure modes and so on. I, I think you can figure figure that out with this print command and, and so on, or you can just clip and, and uh, copy it that way. But I want to show you one other thing. If we go to File and we uh, create a report, I can create a new report here. I'm going to call it uh, uh, just an HTM file, which is called Report. You can give it whatever you, you want and say uh, OK. And it's going to overwrite a previous one I had. But here is. Uh, a summary of what I have uh, done now uh, in in this particular um, example. It has the material properties. It has the safety factors, and and so on. So that's a convenient way to uh, to get all of the uh, information uh, that you've you've used. So those are the two examples that are in the uh, flax slope. Um, Manual. I want to go now to the final example, which is going to be a, a lot closer to the uh, uh, student uh, problem that we're going to give you. Uh, so I'm going to go to uh, models and uh, go to new, and I'm going to call this a new model uh, student. And I'm going to use a general uh, geometry. 
So here we are. It's okay. Grab that as um, 1500 and the height is 1000 or 500 on the left and 5000 on the right. And I'm going to apply that now. Now, this, I'll just go back and work on the on the slope part of it, not the not the boundary part of it. So let's just stick with that. Say okay. Um, I'm going to go to um, build, and this particular example is going to have three layers. So I'm going to put in. Um, uh, a layer at about 100 meters down. So right there is one. I'm going to have another one at, uh, oh, let's say 700 meters. So there's another layer. Um, that's okay. So now I have three materials in this particular uh, slope uh, that I have to assign some properties to. So I'm going to go to material um, and and create some new materials now. Um, so I'm going to call this first one, uh, let's call it soil. And it has a uh, dense, dry density of 2,500. It has a uh, porosity of 0.02, porosity. Uh, notice when I do that, it automatically calculates for me. Um, oops, that's, that's 2,500. It automatically calculates for me um, the um, the wet density of 2,520. The cohesion here for um, this one is going to be um, 100 kilopascals, so I'm going to go here and put in 100 kilopascals, and a tension of one-tenth of that, or 10 kilopascals, a uh, friction angle of 30 degrees, uh, dilation of 10 degrees, and, uh, and that's that particular model. So that's the soil up here. I'm going to have a new material. Uh, which I'll call mid, uh, and it's got the same density, porosity, uh, but it has a higher cohesion. It has 750 kilopascals of cohesion, 75 uh, kilopascals of tension, friction in this example is uh, going to be 45, dilation is 10, and that's my second material. And so I, I'm going to assign that here. Notice I could uh, assign uh, other materials just by, by going on to uh, this list and, and clicking on those and then assigning. That's not what I want here. I want a new material. So I'm going to create this, the last and material and we'll call this um, bottom and put in the properties cohesion for this material is 500 kilopascals and 50 kilopascals tension uh, friction of um, 40 degrees and a um, dilation of 10. I should say, we're going to run a little over. Um, hopefully, people can stay on. Uh, we'll, but we'll finish up pretty quickly here. Um, and, uh, and we'll still have time for questions, so don't worry about that. Let's just try it. Uh, that's OK. Let's go to uh, solve and put a coarse geometry. Now this doesn't look very good. You probably want to run it with a finer geometry, but let's just for the sake of, of this. Whoops, I believe I forgot the water. I did forget the water. So I want to put a water table in here. 
Um, let's make it look something like this. We can just grab it and move it around. Now I have the water table. There we go. Uh, let's solve this using a coarse mesh and solve FOS. Let's see what, what happens. So it has a, um, let's see what the, what the um, failure mode is. So there's the, uh, the failure mode for that particular problem. So, you know, I guess that's not too bad. It's a safety factor of two, uh, which is probably too high. And we, as I said, the, the problem is going to involve optimization. So let's go back and look at how we could optimize this um, a little bit. So we go to build and we go to to, to um, bound. We can now steepen up these slopes simply by moving these things over uh, and make this slope a little bit steeper. Um, let's try let's try that. Um, and now this is this is kind of what we have. Um, we could also um, maybe consider that the water is a little closer. Maybe the dewater is not quite so good. Um, let's look at that, and we can solve this problem. We have a coarse mesh here, uh, and let's solve. Now we're getting a safety factor 1.72, which is still too high if I'm interested in, in, in having a, a safety factor around uh, 1, 1. 1.3. Uh, but maybe I'll stop here. I think you know from here on out, it's, it's just a matter of, of going to the geometry, which is in bound and, and sort of optimizing that. Maybe we make this thing a little bit um, steeper or even a little bit uh, higher and uh, and or changing the uh, changing the uh, the water table um, changing the slope those those things are all just uh, sensitivities and changes you can make to the to the model and as we try and optimize this this thing. So I think um, I, I'll leave it uh, at, at that for now. Um, and Dave, you can maybe, if there are some questions, I can take those now. Okay, great. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, we do have some questions. Okay. Um, so the first one uh, is related to the competition. Um, is it possible for team members uh, to be from different universities or different countries? Huh, that's interesting. We hadn't thought about that. Um, I don't particularly see why not? I don't know. Juan, are you on the line? What do you think? Hello, Lori. Yeah, I, I actually, uh, we have been responding that answer and we think that it would be easier just to have the students from being from the same university, mostly because of the, the price and and all this. Uh, uh, yeah. I think it yeah. makes things easier for the judges and and and, and everything. So we, we have been answering that it is the best to have just the teams from the same universities, I guess. Okay. Um, how robust is flax slope when performing the shear strength reduction for materials whose strength is not defined by a simple cohesion and friction angle? For example, a nonlinear material. Right, so if I go to build and I look at the materials that are available to me, um, and if I, if I create, so the only one that would be nonlinear uh, non is a, a modified hook brown uh, material. I assume what they, what they mean is uh, a material which has a confining stress dependence um, uh, that the failure envelope depends on the, on the confining stress. So uh, a modified hook brown uh, model would give you 
uh, would give you that kind of, of behavior. But it's not set up to handle things like strain softening or any of the other more uh, advanced kind of constitutive uh, relations. Is it possible to use the inherent anisotropy with ubiquitous model? Right, that's really how it's uh, ubiquitous joint model is set up to 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 um, introduce anisotropy into a uh, into a model. So you can see the parameters for this ubiquitous joint down here. It really is a um, directional plasticity model, if 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 you like. So the 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 strength in all of the directions are governed by a more Coulomb uh, strength, but in one particular direction, in the direction of the ubiquitous joints or the direction of the anisotropy, we usually have a, a lower strength in that particular orientation. So as I said, it, it it's good for materials which have have a very pronounced bedding um, uh, schistosity, um, that that kind of, of, of geology. What is the interpretation of the velocity vectors? How do they help identify the failure mechanism? Okay, yeah, good, uh, good, good question. Let's just let's just go back and and uh, look at that just a second. Um, so uh, these are the velocity vectors, um, and they are um, uh, fictitious. Uh, in fact, you don't even, I guess you don't even see a scale. Oh, here's, here's the maximum value of 1.77. Uh, but they don't, they don't mean anything in terms, you know, it's not 1.77 meters per second. They really are just telling you about the failure mode, the direction of movement. If we get failure, how how are things uh, moving? And the the reason they're not real is because this is a quasi-static solution that has uh, damping uh, applied to achieve a quasi-static solution. So while the directions of movement are are real their magnitudes are not um, meaningful other than trying to uh, identify the, the failure, failure mode. What are the meaning of the shear strain rate uh, and, well, and velocity vectors, again, in the result plots given the absence of shear modulus, bulk modulus, and other input properties? Okay, so the good, good question. Um, the the as I said, what flax slope does is it, uh, it it simplifies things. So it actually uses a bulk modulus and a shear modulus uh, in in the calculation. There's 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 one there. You just can't see what it what it is, uh, but it but but it's but it's there. Um, the, the the meaning of um, of this is uh, of the shear strain is very similar to the velocity vectors, just to identify uh, where, where movement is, is occurring. Um, and, and they are rates, so because they are rates, they're really not meaningful. While we're talking here, I'm just going to, I'm going to make a little bit finer grid and you can see um, uh, maybe a little bit, when you go to a, a very fine grid, I don't know if this will do it or not, but you'll begin to get localization of those shear strain uh, rate contours, and you'll actually be able to see better what the uh, failure surface is. Uh, for the purposes of this uh, demonstration, I used a very coarse mesh, so you don't you don't see it quite so well. Um, but here's one with a little bit better mesh so let's let's look at what that uh, tells us so i should point out this is the previous result and where my uh, cursor is with the coarse mesh over here is the result with the with the finer mesh and you can start to see now the concentration of the um, uh, shear strains on the uh, on the failure surface you can also see a pretty nice uh, vertical 
uh, tension crack forming in the in in the back here. Mm -hmm. So they're just all tools to look at failure modes um, that are are being presented. And you know, identifying failure modes is 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 a big thing, and I think people don't pay attention to that mm -hmm. enough. Uh, it really is important that you look at uh, the failure mode, make sure it makes sense, and try and interpret it as best you can uh, with uh, maybe field experience or field evidence. Uh, but in this particular case, in, in a lot of these things where we have continuum models, it's, it's shearing through the toe of the slope with a nice sort of formation of a tension crack in the back. Uh, next question. Uh, tweaks were mentioned about the bracketing values in the SOS calculation. Yeah. Can you never, expand on that? I've never done that, so I, I'll, I'll show you what that is. Um, um, so those are here on, on, under um, the bracketing, and you saw how uh, how it goes about the bracketing. It, it, it actually takes a value in between the two values that it's looking at and then decides whether um, it's, it should be less than or more than that mid value. Um, you know, uh, to be honest, you would have to go in and, uh, and you know, play with some of these values just to see uh, how well it, it, it works. The idea would be to somehow optimize that bracketing scheme. And probably this is a uh, holdover from when computers were a little bit, <laughs> a little bit slower. Uh, FLAC was developed in 1985, I believe. So it's, you know, it's, it's 25, 26 years old. Computers have gotten much faster. Uh, and we've changed some things, but some things are our legacy. I think this option to tweak the bracketing probably is a legacy from when computers were slower, but it's there if people want to play with it. You probably can read about it in the uh, Flax Slope Manual. I've never touched it, so I and and I'm I'm perfectly happy to wait a minute or two to get an answer. I don't I don't want to <laughs> spend my time trying to trying to tweak it to uh, get an answer in a minute 30 seconds instead of a minute 45 seconds. But the, you know it's 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 there. You can read about it, and if you feel like it, you can change it. But I don't think it's necessary. The next question is: Is it's possible to compare the Slack Slope results with slide software? Um, but I I don't think we have have anything like that. Yeah, and there are, believe me, there are n numbers of, of papers, journal journal papers, where people have have done that, uh, because. You know that's what people are interested in. They want to know uh, how how good a numerical model is compared to a limit equilibrium model. And, and as I said, if you have simple failure surfaces, like the, the like the, like we're showing here, um, you know the numerical model and the uh, limit equilibrium models are going to be very close. The difference starts to appear. When you have um, different failure modes, sliding on very weak surfaces, if you form a passive active block, if you have internal deformation, and that's because that's one of the problems with um, limit equilibrium is there's no internal deformation. It assumes that the whole uh, body moves as a as a uh, as a rigid body in, in in many cases so you can't get internal um, deformation uh, and and you know people get fooled too they 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 look at the anisotropy and limit equilibrium and they put it in and they think that it's actually uh, using that but f but the anisotropy and the limit equilibrium model is only used if the failure surface runs parallel to that. So if you had, for example, a toppling problem, you'd put in anisotropy, but the, the, the limit equilibrium model will never will never see it. It won't use it. Um, so you think you're doing something that you're that you're not. 
Uh, the numerical models, if you put in, uh, you know, a toppling orientation in the ubiquitous joint model here, it will use that to uh, as part of the solution uh, because the continuum models, finite element, finite difference, uh, whatever, each of the zones has its own behavior and its own properties and so on. And uh, it's only when you put that all together into a large slope that you see what the emergent slope behavior uh, is. Um, next question, uh, what is the role of the water table? Good, yeah, and I, I'm sorry, I didn't go, go through that. The role of the water table is to provide water pressure, and I'll, let me see if I can show you that here. Um, so let's go plot items. Let's turn off the, um, the contouring. Let's put the pore pressure there, and let's put the water table on here and look at this. Okay, so here, here is that water table that we defined, this upper sort of magenta line, and you can see the pore pressure contours uh, below. So it does, it does two things. The main thing it does is it provides effective stress in the uh, constitutive relation uh, computation. So all, uh, all well-formulated material models or constitutive relations work on effective stresses, not, not total stresses. Uh, and the pressures uh, that are shown here are used in each and every one of those zones to calculate the effective stress and to um, see where it falls relative to the failure, failure envelope. That's the main thing that it does. Um, the other thing that it does, as I said, it provides a, a division between dry density of the material up above and the wet density of the material below. Now, in this particular case, and in most rock cases, the, the differences are small because the porosities are, are, are small. But the main thing that the water table does is to provide uh, water pressure for effective stress calculations in the material model. For ARMA student design, what else is, are the judges expecting to see um, besides the basic software operation experience? Yeah, uh, so you'll see in um, in the in the example, and I'll I'll just tell you a little bit more about it. Um, there is a uh, an economic part to it because it, it, it's going to be a mining open pit mining uh, example, and you're going to uh, be asked to sort of optimize the, the, the slope design uh, on an economic basis. So that's, that, that's, that's part of it. Uh, the, the materials are gonna have some variability to them. So the, 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 the answer uh, will ask you, you know, to discuss uh, how you handle variability, how you handle the economics, um, and you know what, you know some other kinds of general things about you know what do you see in terms of of risk if this was a real uh, a real problem. Uh, so it, it backbone of it is a slope stability evaluation using some kind of software. As I said, it doesn't have to be flat slope. Then um, you know, an optimization of of that. We're, we're you know we're we're hoping everybody can manipulate uh, uh, programs uh, pretty pretty well uh, and and get and get answers. But it's it's a little bit about the th thought process of going from the beginning of the problem through to the final uh, answer. Those things will be d detailed in the in the uh, problem when it when it's uh, when it when it's set out. Okay. Uh, the next question is just asking about examples um, using support, and I'll, I'll just add that there are several um, examples in the manual um, that you can refer to, and uh, they, inc they include the data files. And um, so we would refer you to the uh, to the Flaxlope manual to learn more about using support systems. 
Yeah, yeah, I think there's 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 good examples just from memory for I think Rockbolts and I think GeoGrid. If you've never looked at an Itasca manual, they are detailed in in excruciating <laughs> uh, amounts. Uh, they're very well uh, written, um, and you will have no problem finding examples for that and following them. The next question is asking about technical support. Um, I guess regarding the software itself, and in, in general, since we moved Flaxslope uh, to be freeware, um, we we don't actually provide um, ongoing technical support uh, for free for Flaxslope. Um, things like if there's a if you think there's a bug or a, in the software, that's something we would definitely respond to and, and fix. If you think you've identified something like that. I don't know, or if you want to add something specific to the competition. Yeah, um, I, I think so. I, I, I'll be surprised if you run into any problems that really require um, support, but but you never know. And and I, I would say, you know, if you get stuck on something, something's not working uh, the the way you 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 think it is, uh, or or it should be. Um, uh, you can send, and you can send it to me. I'll 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 try and work with or find somebody that will will help. I think during the time period of the, of, of the competition. But one of the things uh, that there is, uh, if you, if as I said, if if you if you save the the, the project and it has a PSL extension, um, and if you're having a problem, I think if you just send us that particular file, we should be able to maybe sort out what's what what the issue is. But you know, I, I I'm I'm hopeful that uh, we don't have just a <laughs> a huge amount of uh, uh, of problems. And if people do get stuck, uh, I'll I'll try and uh, try and help them uh, with with that and 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 just so they don't get uh, to a point where they can't uh, get an answer to the to the to the problem i'm not going to tell people how to get the answer but if you get stuck with some of the mechanics of the of the running of the of the model uh, I'll, I'll be glad to help so the next question is what are the units of the shear strain rate uh so strain is dimensionless uh, are you able to analyze the failure in the mid top layer Slope. Yeah, uh, this one. Yeah. So um, the, the the question is, um, can you resolve the safety factor in the middle slope? So you can exclude the, the anything you want to from the from the calculation. So you could exclude uh, the upper and lower materials from that calculation and find out what the stability of that middle uh unit is by itself of course the other way to do that would just be to go in and give those other materials artificially high uh values so that they don't fail uh, but I, I think there is some some facility you can't exclude uh if you do that at the beginning when you set it up certain regions from the calculation of of safety factor but it can be done sure can you change the failure direction of the model Failure direction is 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 what it is. Um, I, I can flip these models around as we showed with the, uh, you know, if you want to make it a mirror image, you know, if 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 it's for presentation purposes, if it's easier to have the slope, you know, pointing to the left instead of pointing to the right, that's that's the only thing that's available there. Uh, can you use the software for probability of failure? So, good question. Um, directly, you know, it doesn't do a probability of failure calculation for you. However, there are several techniques uh, that can be used that uh, will allow you to, you have to run some more models, uh, but they, they allow you to uh, calculate probability of of failure and those things are things like uh, response surface method, point estimate method. There's some other things 
So you could use flag slope to run the, the cases which are the, the basis for those probability of failure calculations. Flag slope won't do it automatically for you. Does the program just take automatically the most critical failure? Yeah, it, find, it, it finds uh, the most critical failure. That's the whole objective of the of the analysis. Is the is the software and is looking to find the most critical uh, failure surface. That is the one with the lowest safety factor. Um, and that's its whole <laughs> purpose uh, is is to do that but it does find the critical uh, failure mode. Does the program allow us to consider seismic effects dynamic? So it doesn't do a dynamic analysis where you would feed in a, um, a, an earthquake record, for example, into the base of the model. So if you were doing a tailings dam analysis or any other kind of seismic analysis, there's really two ways to do that. One is uh, to feed in uh, an earthquake history to the base of, of, of the model. So you it's a timed history of accelerations and you would feed that into the base of the model and see what happens. That's a dynamic analysis. What most people do is something which is simplified. It's called a, a pseudo static analysis where you give a horizontal acceleration to gravity. So if I had done that, if I had when we set the, the model up and I had model options, I could have a non-standard gravity check there. And then uh, when I went to, uh, to look at that, think under build, uh, here's the gravity. Um, and, and so I could assign a horizontal uh, acceleration. I could either move that little you know this little wheel here to to give the the uh, acceleration, or I could um, I could change um, its its direction. Uh, you know I could give its components. For example, the vertical could be 9.81, and if it was 0.1 g uh, to uh, let's let's say to the uh, to the left, I could have minus 0.981 that would be 0.1 g acting acting out of the model we'll just see what this what this does then um, so I, i've i've assigned a, a 0.1 g horizontal acceleration outside you can see it's dropped the the uh, the failure mode a lot it was at 1.2 it's at 1.05 now so that's that's how you would um uh, in, in most cases, apply a dynamic analysis using a uh, program like LAC. Uh, the same thing would be true in limit equilibrium. You, you would apply a horizontal acceleration. It's, it's called pseudo-static dynamic analysis because it's not really a dynamic analysis. You're just kind of assuming that gravity is acting horizontally for or, or a component of gravity is acting horizontally in, in a constant manner. It's a very approximate method, but you know people people use it and um, and it's fine. Right, and then of course for a full dynamic analysis, you would you would do something like flat. Correct. You know, if it took anything more serious. Uh, would require a dynamic analysis, and those require something like FLAC, and you you then have to worry very much about uh, what the shear modulus is and how it might change with different frequency components, and uh, you know what the dynamic behavior of the materials are. And you change the damping; you could no longer use damping for quasi-static analysis. You'd have to reduce the damping. Um, way way down to do those kinds of analysis but those are very specialized uh, things that are done for critical things like tailings dams and and civil dams and things like that using the ubiquitous model can we simulate failure modes observed in rock slopes uh, e.g plane sliding or toppling 
Yeah, you 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 can. The the toppling is a little tricky because um, the toppling usually involves uh, joints which are spaced, um, you know, five, ten meters apart, maybe, and you get toppling on on those. Ubiquitous joint model assumes that there is no spacing between the joints, so it's very finely um, spaced, uh, and so you you can do it with with some care um you can use a ubiquitous joint model to simulate a a, a weak layer um uh, but you might want to also consider then just an interface for um for that uh, as well and again uh, th those examples are in the manual i didn't show any of those today what is the criteria for the better safety factor the uh, safety factor is, you know, either set by kind of experience or it's set by uh, kind of risk tolerance that uh, that people are willing to accept. And it's different for civil than it is for for mining. It, in all cases, you want to have a safety factor more than more than one. Um, you know, and if it's a, you know, a very critical civil structure, you might want a safety factor of 1.5. If you have a mining, temporary mining slope, uh, which doesn't have much uh, impact, if it fails, maybe you want 1.1. But, you know, those are the kinds of ranges that people normally uh, talk about and and there are all kinds of things again written about the de design acceptance criteria what what should be uh used for uh the acceptability of a design right i wonder if that question is also prompted because you were rerunning that last example trying to get a smaller safety factor. oh yeah 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 i was just trying to get something uh, I think we started out with two, which you know, in a mining uh, environment, you would never want. You want because it's not economical. Usually, you'd want to have something closer to 1.3. So I was just playing with that, but you never would want to come up with a design which is less than one. Does the software only calculate circular fault surfaces, or does it have an option to calculate non-circular failure surfaces? So yeah. Um, these problems that I showed you, while they look like they're circular, uh, they're not. The software does not define a geometry whatsoever. These simple models look like they're circles, but they're they're not. It, they will find, uh, you know, the failure surface that again has the lowest uh, safety safety factor. And only in very simple cases is it going to be circular. Even those are not. If you would get the geometry and put put it on there, they're not circular. If you see some of the other examples in the manual, you'll see other failure mechanisms. The next question is if uh, other software packages are freely available, and uh, the answer to that is we just recently made um, Plaxlope, uh freeware, but um, our other software is is still commercial um, and and um, is uh, uh, has a cost to it. Um, they all do have demos, though, that you can download uh, for free and try out. Um, and the only limitation of the demos is the size of the model. So you can run small models, um, even in dynamic analysis, all the options are available. Uh, the only limit is the number of zones or the number of blocks, uh, depending on the software that you can run. In the case of pseudostatic analysis, which is the correct way to introduce a KH and KV? value um so with that with that uh gravity that that i showed you in the example here let's see what i, I didn't change i didn't change any of those things let me go back and look at the model options and and just do this again so this has non-standard every let's see i'm kind of doing some things backwards here but i think it'll and this, uh, I, maybe some of these questions get get asked, but those KHs and KVs would 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 go in here with those components uh, down down at the bottom, and then you can put in whatever you like. The question is whether <clears throat> water flow is calculated. It does not calculate water flow. Flac 
can calculate water flow. Flax slope just uses a, a water table or phreatic surface, and it assumes that the pressure beneath that water table is hydrostatic. So it's an approximation, and it you know it's better for a more highly permeable material than a lower permeability material. But it's a, again a very common assumption. There's a question about the competition in terms of um, format basic requirements uh, and whether the design needs to be published. Um, I assume that will all be on the website for the Correct. competition. Correct. Um, and the next question is about the, uh, it's a specific one, what the J-angle button does. And I think that's on the plot. Um, and that essentially, if you have a ubiquitous joint model, it will um, plot for every zone uh, the orientation of the the angle that you specify. Yeah, let's just let's just see what that looks like here. Let's take this bottom one and edit it. Let's see if I can do that. Let's just put a joint angle of of thirty degrees there. I don't know if it, it's not going to let me do it without putting in some values let's put a joint friction of 25 and no cohesion let's we'll just run this now it's likely to look ugly but that's not the the purpose is to so i put in A ubiquitous joint angle. Let's just run this thing and see what see what happens. But I can demonstrate the plotting so you can see what it it looks like. So yeah, well, now we got a safety factor less than 0.5. I thought it would be pretty ugly. <laughs> Let's see what uh, here's the with the ubiquitous joint. So it's this. Yeah. So there's that's kind of the the, the model. It, it it looks ugly because we have a very coarse uh, mesh in in here uh, in a very low safe a very low safety factor less than a half. But what I wanted to show then is we go back to plot and items. Here's the joint angle. So there you can see that's that's the joint angle that we put into the into the model. So you can you can see what it is and try and try and see what it's it's doing but it's it's making no sense because it's it's just a kind of a ridiculous problem kindly explain how can we generate poor pressure in continuum modeling okay so you can generate poor pressures in continuum models you can't you can't generate any poor pressures in flax slope uh, as i said you just have a, a phreatic surface and and that's all you get uh so you 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 have a, or pressures that are the result of the phreatic surface. In and I'm assuming maybe this question is, has to do with 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 flak. Uh, you can generate um, pressures in rock, or you can generate it in in soil. And you know the the, the classic case in soil is where you load a, a, a footing in a saturated media. Um, and then, as that pressure dissipates, you get settlement of that of that footing um, over time. So consolidation occurs, uh, but you can generate high pore pressures uh, in soil or rock. It doesn't really depend on on whether it's soil or rock. You can you can do it either way. Either you're compressing a joint or you're compressing a matrix, and um, and they both can generate they both can dissipate but again those kinds of problems are are solved with either flac or udec or 3dec or flac 3d and they can generate and they can dissipate uh, water pressures but not flac slope what is the difference between the shear strength and unconfined compressive strength methods a factor of safety solution um, control for hook brown oh. so when you're in the solution. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, let's just go back and, uh, and and just look at that a little bit. Um, 
let's edit this. So if I were looking at, at, at Hook Brown, um, you know, one of the input parameters to uh, Hook Brown is the unconfined compressive strength. Uh, so you can um, do the safety factor analysis when it comes to time to, to do that um, different ways. I mean, the, the most common way and the one which is a direct analog to, to what we do in more Coulomb uh, is to reduce the friction and cohesion simultaneously. Well, when you have a, a hook brown material, you have lots of frictions and lots of cohesions. So what you're doing is in each zone where you know the confining stress, you know the tangent to the failure envelope, you know the friction, you know the cohesion, you're dropping those things uh, according to the, the strength reduction factor. Another way to do it that some people like to do is they say, well, I don't, I don't really know about that, but I, I know about unconfined compressive strength. And so they just reduce the unconfined compressive strength to get failure rather than reducing the whole failure envelope. Now, reducing the unconfined compressive strength affects the failure envelope, uh, but you're just working with one component of the failure envelope. That's the difference. Flack is a continuum model and not discrete. Which constitutive model do you recommend for rock mass? And if we want to include joints, how could we do that? So, um, so for rock masses, um, in general, continuum models don't s simulate rock masses particularly well. Uh, although, you know, a hook brown model gets us towards that. Um, the, the, the problem with continuum models is they, they really treat everything like a soil. Even, even a hook brown model treats the rock mass as a, as, as a soil, but it provides good engineering estimates uh, that people can, can, can use. Um, so I, I guess in, in, in our work, uh, we kind of recognize that, but we recognize we can't put every joint into a model that we would like to. Um, and uh, so we, we often put, you know, as many of those in as we can explicitly, and the rest of it, we make a hook brown uh, material. Uh, with with flat slope, you're kind of forced to make a decision. You, you're either going to use hook brown or going to use the ubiquitous joint model. And, and maybe you, you know just want to try those two different things and see what what the what the differences are. Uh, we we currently have in the Itasca library of, of models a hook brown model which also has ubiquitous joint behavior in it. So it's a hook brown material with the ubiquitous joints, and that's a pretty powerful kind of of uh, of model for rock masses. But it's still a continuum. And a lot of behaviors are not continuum behaviors, uh, particularly brittle failure models are not well handled by by continuum. But you know sometimes you just have to use what you have and you know make make interpretations based on that, realizing it may not be the best thing in the in the arsenal. But yeah, uh, so first first prize would be some sort of discontinuum model for for rock. Uh, second prize would be uh, some sort of um discontinuum model with widely spaced joints and uh, a hook brown material between them or a ubiquitous joint model between them and third prize would you know be just sort of a continuum model with with uh, with a hook brown material next question um and there's about six left okay so in mining activity there is seismic waves from blasting and equipment movement, how can we input that parameter in calculating FOS? Yeah, pretty difficult to do. Um, you know, if you the only thing you could do it would be to try to convert that to a, a pseudo-static horizontal acceleration 
most people haven't been successful at that. And most people don't worry too much about uh, certainly equipment movement. They do worry about, about blasts, and, and we do those kinds of analyses, but we use a dynamic model to, to do that. So, and we explicitly model the blast and the propagation of the, of the waves to the points of, of interest, to a slope or whatever. Uh, but it takes, um, you know, it takes more than what you're able to do with, with, with flax slope. It's, it's a, it's a much more detailed analysis involving, uh, the explosive, the layout, the timing, uh, the, uh, and the propagation of those waves in a dynamic model, uh, to, to address those questions. And of course, if you wanted to represent the, the, um, after effects of something like a blast, you could have uh, different properties, say, along the uh, surface uh, skin of your pit or slope with uh, sort of reduced um, or damaged properties. Um, but it, it wouldn't actually be the, the seismic event, but it would be that uh, reduction in, in properties due to, for example, production scale blasting. Right. Do the displacements we obtain from a safety analysis have some meaning? No, um, they they don't. I should say also this is a small strain model, so we're not modeling large strain. Uh, I don't even think you can plot uh, displacements. I'll be surprised if you can plot uh, items. No, there's no displacement uh, on there. Um, so I mean, we're, we're really plotting, the, the, the purpose of flax slope is to distinguish between stability and instability. It's, not, its job is not to calculate displacements. Uh, again, any of the other software in the Itasca family uh, can, can do that. Uh, this is a very uh, limited kind of capability uh, model aimed at understanding stability. But so you can't, you can't plot displacements, you can't see them. Would it be possible to input a DFN model in a rock slope in flax? I'm not sure if they meant flax slope. Uh, you can't do it in flax slope. You can input DFNs into, into 3DEC and I think into UDEC. You can in flax 3D too. Uh, the, the, the 3D codes have that uh, capability. So flax 3D. Mm -hmm. 3DEC can, can accept a DFN. Yeah, and UDEC and PFC as well. Okay. Yeah, I wasn't sure if they could. And we also are, are developing a code called Slope Model, which would use uh, DFN, but it's a nodal based uh, type of next generation software. Is the software usable for all types of failure? No. It's, it's it, for example, you, you couldn't use it as we were talking about before a case where you generated uh, a poor pressure either by loading or uh, you know maybe seismic shaking so if you were trying to simulate a, a tailings dam where material compacts and generates poor pressures so you wouldn't uh, you, you couldn't get that failure mode uh, you can't get any kind of failure mode that involves um, block behavior. Uh, now, having said that, you can get a, a simple, you know, one uh, block kind of failure mode by putting in an interface to slide on and having a tension cut off in, the, in, in there. So you can get a block sliding mode of failure uh, but you know, it, you're not going to get wedge failures. You're not going to get block toppling. You know, so there. It, but but all of the other you know more continuum type failure modes you should be able to to get. One of the things I didn't mention uh, is the capability to do axisymmetric analyses. You have to. Uh, uh, get that at the very beginning under model options, but you can do an axisymmetric model, which allows you to look at things like slope curvature. You know, if you had a, a pit which was, and all pits are curved, so, uh, but to more or less extent. The analyses shown here are all two-dimensional plane strain, that is, they're, they're infinite in extent. 
But you can look at axisymmetric models where the pit or the slope is assumed to be either a uh, an inverted cone or a, a normal cone. It can go go either way. But so there, and that's a, a nice feature to be able to to use to try to examine the impacts of slope curvature. In command prompt mode, when we solve the model, we get different output values of strain and displacement compared to when we analyze output after solving at the FOS. Yeah, I think and this is a, I think this is a flat question where you can get displacements and you can get much, much more information. I think it's also the difference between when you're doing the FOS analysis, the properties are being adjusted to get to that failure. Whereas when you're just running FLAC uh, directly, or you're actually inputting a specific set of properties or properties with some distribution, but it's, it's one case. Uh, so that might also account for any differences that you're seeing in results. So is the acceleration in the x direction uh, is that equivalent to the seismic coefficient for a limit equilibrium times the PGA? Yeah, I think it is. You know, you know, th things like 0.1 g would be common for a horizontal acceleration. Somebody's asking about the trench stability analysis for slurry used to uh, model or diaphragm wall, wall construction. So I would actually direct. Um, direct you if you're interested in, in more trenching um, diaphragm wall construction to to look at flak um, and uh, there are a number of kind of uh, civil wall construction examples in the manual so uh, and on the website so I would direct you there and that is the end of the questions I'd like to like to thank you Lauren and and Juan um, and uh, thank everybody who attended and for those of you who have stuck out to the very end. Um, that's great. Uh, it's a fantastic response. So we hope this uh, is helpful to people who are interested in the um, competition or for others who are just interested in flat slope. The presentation and the Q&A session has been recorded. So we will uh, send uh, an email out to everybody with instructions next week how to uh, download the, the recording, the uh, slides as a PDF, and, and some other information. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, this concludes the webinar, and I hope everybody has a, a good day. Thank you.